Have you lost your sex drive? Are you worried that it is never going to come back? <laughs> Does it seem like there is just no discernible physiological reason for this lack of interest, and yet this very important part of you seems to have simply disappeared? Well, if this applies to you, then you are going to want to stick around for this segment. Now, in this clip, we are going to examine a question posed by my online community members. And I'm going to paraphrase this question so as to clarify the concepts that we are going to be exploring. So the question goes like this. I have a history of dating either emotionally unavailable men or volatile men, but I refuse to do it anymore. I want a healthy, secure relationship. Since putting my foot down, however, I feel like I have lost my sex drive altogether. Or maybe I'm just not attracted to good guys. What is happening to me? Am I doomed? So to answer this question, I am going to approach it from within three frameworks. First, a psychobiological uh, perspective, then through the Hindu chakra system, and then through the human design system. So by the end of the segment, you will be able to release stigmatizing and self-punishing beliefs for being unable to let an unhealthy partner go have an introductory understanding of how the chakra system intersects with early attachment um, experiences in childhood, and also how that can affect your re adult relationships today. And you'll also have an introductory understanding of how your energy influences um, why you are attracted to certain types of people and what you can do about it. Now, there are a lot of new topics in this particular discussion that I'm going to be raising that I have never discussed so openly before. So make sure that you bring your pen and paper because it is likely that you're going to want to save this video and come back and take notes. But first, if you are new to my online community, welcome. My name is Brianna McWilliam, and I am a licensed and board certified creative arts therapist with more than 15 years in the field helping adults struggling with insecure attachment go from self-doubting to self-sovereign so they can attract the soul-shaking passionate partnerships that they want. And I do this using a psycho-spiritual approach to creative arts interventions, which I call the McWilliam Method. The content on my YouTube channel is derived from my online courses, which you can learn more about through the link in the caption of this video. If you would like to learn more about your attachment style, you can take the four question quiz. If you like what you see in here and you want to learn more, make sure you like, subscribe, and ring the bell for notifications. I put up videos once a week and I wouldn't want you to miss out. Okay, so how might we explain a loss of sex drive after deciding to change the type of partners that we want to attract or be attracted to? Well, first let's approach this from within the psychobiological perspective. So it's worthwhile mentioning that the naturally occurring chemicals of love that influence us, especially when they are distributed on an intermittent reinforcement, can have the same effect on you as drug addiction, um, especially if that's what you find arousing in love. So specifically, these neurochemicals um, can lead us to equate loving feelings with a kind of adrenaline high particularly if you have experienced attachment wounding or trauma in your past. So that means that there is a level of threat or drama that you require unconsciously in relationships in order to feel sexually aroused or loving towards your partners. So a lot of people describe this as needing to feel challenged in love, but this is usually um, understating the very intense emotional highs and lows that they are actually chasing. So anthropologist and brain researcher Helen Fisher refers to this phenomenon as frustration attraction. So in a roller coaster relationship, chemically speaking, these intermittent, intense, and exciting experiences, they can stimulate a release of dopamine in the brain, similar to what happens with cocaine addiction. So this is exacerbated by periods of adversity or discord in a relationship. So the stress that you feel heightens your focus and your attention on an inconsistent partner because they are both a threat and a source of comfort to you. And that releases stress hormones, adrenaline, and even more dopamine. Furthermore, if you are sexually intimate with this person, your oxytocin is going to bond you to them and it makes you chemically blind to their mistreatment of you. Studies have shown this can happen. At the same time, your serotonin drops. 
So you are obsessing over them and you're increasingly horny. And that is only going to keep that vicious cycle going. So if this sounds like your situation, then I actually recommend conceptualizing your breakup as a form of addiction recovery. So you're quite literally going to be physically withdrawing from naturally occurring neurochemicals that compel you to return to your drug of choice, which in this case is partners with whom you experience what is sometimes called trauma reenactments or trauma bonding. That means that your brain and your attachment system is going to be inflamed looking for either that specific person or this particular relationship dynamic. So you are quite literally going to feel pain and achiness in your body. In fact, research shows that taking an aspirin when you're heartbroken actually helps you feel better. You also want to recognize that you are looking, when you are looking for this type of relationship or when you experience what's sometimes referred to as love addiction, what you're looking for is connection. And the most fundamental connection that you are searching for is a connection to yourself because that is, we feel more alive with these partners and because we feel more ourselves, we feel like we have more access to ourselves, to our own pleasurable feeling states. We're happy to be with ourselves, right? But this is, this is more like a food addiction because you can't exactly go cold turkey, right? But if you are to kick the habit, you can't go cold turkey on human connection, but if you are to kick the habit, you cannot eat the same foods that you've always been eating in the way that you've always eaten them. So you have to love and cherish yourself enough to treat yourself to something better, right? So to choose a new path means that you are resetting your nervous system response and you need to give that at least a good six months to a year. And a lack of sex drive during this time and in this particular context, I would argue, is not evidence of a loss of something, but it's really a good sign that your body and your mind and your spirit are finally all getting on the same page. And they're kind of forcing you not to get distracted because you are germinating something new to be birthed. You are, are, are asking on a deep and profound spiritual level to feel a genuine desire for something entirely different, right? So if you can kind of lean into that and be patient and make your way through it, there is a light at the end of that tunnel and your sex drive is going to trickle back in, in the way that the sunlight warms the room. Um, now, if you want to learn more about this particular explanation, I do have a video on my YouTube channel, which looks at brain chemistry and frustration attraction. And I will leave a link to that uh, in the caption of this video. One thing I do want to add to this explanation before we move on is that it would not explain a loss of sex drive for everyone and not in every context. So if you want to learn more about what contexts might apply to your situation, if it is not like this one, I do have another video on my YouTube channel called Does a Lack of Sexual Interest Relate to Avoidant Attachment? There will be a link to that um, also in the caption. Now, the next framework I would like to share with you is the Hindu chakra system. So... Early attachment experiences, roughly from zero to two, correlate to the development of the root and the sacral chakras. So the root chakra is this one down here, and the sacral chakra is the red one, and the sacral on this graph is indicated by the blue um, dot right there, okay? Um, and these really lay the foundation for various aspects of adult sexuality, okay? So... The root chakra, as I said before, it's lo located in the genital region, and the right of the root is to exist. The shadow aspect of the root is fear, and the root chakra is primarily associated with a feeling of being safe and comfortable in your own body, and it's primarily concerned with basic survival. So for individuals that have disruptions in the root, or let's say energetic constriction or blockages in their root, they often feel like they have to earn their way because otherwise they don't have a right to literally be here. These individuals tend to have a lot of worthiness issues and they feel like they're a burden to their partners. They're very fearful of being abandoned or rejected because that leads to shortened survival on the level of the instinctual brain. And so you lose the right to exist, quite literally to be. Okay. Now the sacral chakra, this is, that's the orange dot, remember, just above the root. So this one is between the hips, below the navel, above the genital region. And the right of the sacral chakra is to feel. 
The shadow aspect is guilt, and it is associated with creativity, emotionality, sexuality, and the ability to abstract by holding opposites. In other words, the ability to withstand conflicting feelings, channel life force energy into various forms of relational connection and attraction, and be able to conceptualize dualities and ambiguities without needing to split everything into good or bad, black or white thinking. And so healthy evolution of the sacral leads to healthy emotional boundaries. So with sacral uh, blockages, we often feel like we don't have a right to our feelings. And so we look out into the world to validate our inner experiences, unable to give ourselves permission to just feel what we feel. And very often we are struggling with either too loose or too rigid boundaries. So if something goes wrong, we cannot handle the anxiety. If ambiguous or conflicted feelings emerge, we have to what's called split. And that means that we decide we must be inherently bad or they must be inherently bad, right? Or they must be the villain. There's no gray area. There's no in between. There's no room for people to be good and bad, for relationships to be meaningful, loving, and mostly good, but still not long lasting. And so the loudest mouthpiece of the shadow aspect of the sacral is usually your inner judge and critic. It also evolves again between ages uh, one to two. So we have, it's likely that we have a wounded inner child hanging out in the root and sacral, if not more than one, right? So if you're very hard on yourself, you know your sacral needs a little TLC, right? Now, we are more likely to live in the shadow expression of these chakras if your childhood development was interrupted or molded by an extreme uh, emotional circumstance, uh, forms of emotional dismissal, social or familial conditioning, right? That was particularly harsh, especially if there were abusive assaults on the body itself, right? This can create an energy that is either over or undercharged, especially in these areas specifically, right? So then these these are really the strongest, the root and the sacral are really some of the strongest energy centers in the body, okay? Because they propel us towards development, okay? Um, and so then in adulthood, when we experience disruptions in their development, it gets translated into a variety of things, including hyper or hypo sexuality, emotional frigidity or explosivity, or fast cycling between the two, we might then try to avoid or alleviate that anxiety and pressured energy that gets created through things, these things like ingestive or non-ingestive addictions, eating disorders, or attempting to accomplish a sense of aliveness through things like um, high-risk behaviors or being novelty-seeking, right? So the natural high uh, that we get when we are infatuated can sometimes become an exaggerated hook into experiencing this compulsively as well. And maybe that gets expressed through things like love bombing or love addiction, things like that, okay? So learning to unblock, activate, balance, harmonize these energy centers is really crucial to experiencing felt changes on the body level as opposed to just accruing a lot of information and insight that never seems to really make you feel any differently, okay? So if you want to learn more about that, I do have a couple videos on my YouTube channel. One is called Charge in the Body, and the other is Healing Through Limbic Experiences. If you really want to dig into it, you can check out my um, course. It's an enrichment course. It's called Healing Through the Chakras, where we go through all the chakras and we work on this uh, much more specifically. Now, lastly, I want to talk about human design because it is a framework for understanding the behavior of energy that I personally find really fascinating right now, and I'm currently studying to be a, a reader. So human design is a very complex system. This was channeled by Ra Uruhu in 1987, and it brings together the principles of I Ching, astrology, the Kabbalah, Hindu chakra system, and quantum physics. So your human design chart, also called a body graph, is calculated using your birth date, time, and place to reveal your genetic design. So human design provides basically a map of how your body organizes energy and how that energetic organization affects your self-concept, the way you show up in the world, your compatibility with other people, and the best strategy for making decisions in everyday life. So it suggests that you have 
an unchanging energetic blueprint through which you are filtering all of your experience on both a conscious and an unconscious level. Okay. Now, if you want to learn more about this, um, I'm going to type there or on the screen, you should be able to see, I'm going to type there um, a website you can check out. It's called uh, my, oh, I may not let me do it. Okay. I'm just going to say it. Myhumandesign.com. And the other one is called geneticmatrix.com. So I am not affiliated with these websites, but I find them personally very useful. And you can get a free human design chart if you go to those websites and put in your information. Okay. I'm also going to be sharing um, some images that of my own chart that I uh, got from these websites. So again, not affiliated with them, but super useful. Highly recommend myhumandesign.com or geneticmatrix.com. Okay. So we're going to share some images again. Okay. So according to human design, in the late 1800s, humans had fully evolved from the Hindu seven center chakra system, which is the one that we just talked about, um, to a nine center system, energy system. So this is an image of what the human design chart looks like. However, you know, the roles of the root and the sacral chakras specifically remained very similar. Okay. So what is unique about this system is how very specifically the behavior of energy and the way that it works is described and understood. So for example, your energy centers can be what's called defined or undefined. So your defined centers, those are going to be um, colored in, let's go back one. Those are going to be colored in on your graph. Okay. The colors at this point, I'm not going to talk about the the colors themselves, I'm just making it uniform. So when these open centers are, these centers are colored in on your graph, they're called defined. When they are open, they are considered to be undefined, okay? So defined energy centers, this is what allows you to exert more conscious control over how your energy is behaving, um, relevant to that center's function. You also naturally generate energy in these centers, which means that you will actively experience, process, express energy in these centers for you consistently and in predictable ways. Okay. So for example, in my chart, you can see that the colored squares and triangles and diamonds, these all represent the defined centers for me. So that means that I bring consistent degree of energy in these centers to any new project that I apply myself to, right? Um, so just to advance a little bit, just to more clearly illustrate this, these would be the defined centers in my chart, okay? Now, <clears throat> the undefined centers, these are my undefined centers, the undefined centers represent areas of fascination, discovery, and education in this lifetime without an attachment to a specific predictable way of experiencing things or expressing things. Meaning these are the areas where there's more flexibility and receptivity to experience in your energy in a variety of ways. So the challenge with undefined centers is our intrinsic insecurities live in these areas usually. So since we do not have a reliable energetic flow that occurs in these parts of ourselves, we're not quite able um, to know how to function within them. So we don't have a, an inherent sense of that. So we may compensate by trying to become more like people in our environments or who do seem to have those centers defined. So you're also more likely to take in their energy and to be attracted to them for that reason. So once you take in that energy, um, it can also become amplified within you. So if you have an open center and you take energy in those spaces, that energy can become amplified within you. So for example, on my chart, you can see that I have an open root center, okay? To this day, <laughs> and we've seen a demonstration of this you know, in the previous segment, to this day, I struggle with feeling comfortable in my own body. I struggle with body weight and body image. I have for a long time. Historically, I've had a lot of worthiness issues and needing to earn my keep so as not to feel like a burden to anyone. I also feel a tremendous pressure to work myself into the ground, exhausting my body beyond its tolerance. 
When a project is put in front of me, I have to do it until it is done. I am not able to pace myself with these things often or consistently titrate that kind of pressure. So this has served me actually in a lot of ways, but it can deplete me also. So having an open route means that I am particularly susceptible to other people's energy in that center. And I need to work on deconditioning the kind of turtle shell that gets created as like an amalgamation of everybody else's stuff that gets collected there. And it doesn't really serve me. Okay. However, and like in this case, it could be like, you know, all the popular images that I receive around body image or all the messages I got around being too fat or too skinny or too this or too that, right? I don't have a filter for it. I just take it in and it becomes hard within me. However, because this part, um, this is part of an unchangeable and an unconscious aspect of my chart. In other words, I'm born with this. For me, deconditioning the root, which means, you know, loosening, softening all of that, it is a lifelong process. It is going to be a lifelong process for me. But it's truly intended as a gift. And that is how I choose to wield it, right? Because a lot of what I do in my work as an educator and as an art therapist is I reflect the wisdom that I have gained from my root and also from the other open centers in my chart, which means that I'm effectively utilizing this open center as what's called a wound of wisdom, meaning whatever we gather in these open centers is usually what we're here to learn about and then turn around and share with other people in service to them, right? So in this respect, I'm actually quite aligned with my design, my including my open route. So this is why I usually tell insecure folks you cannot achieve um, secure attachment by eliminating your insecurity. It's about changing your relationship to insecurity, your orientation towards it and how it serves you, right? So for another example, um, because I have an open route, I am always going to feel the pressure, as I said before, to see a project through, right? And usually the minute it's put in front of me, it is going to plague me night and day thinking about it until it gets done usually because I assign, it's most likely, because I assign an aspect of my worthiness to the completion of that project, right? But now that I know that that is my default response, I can make increasingly conscious choices to intervene using what tools I have to alleviate the idea that I have to get it done and I have to get it done perfectly and right away. And I can more consciously ease that pressure through learned ways of taking better care of my health and my body as I do so right? And those become the wisdoms that I impart to my clients. So for those of you that were here for the previous segment, we demonstrated an activity of how to love yourself more. And we did the, you know, we went in, we did scribble drawing and we spoke to the self and the self that I shared was a self that feels sick and wishes I would stop working, <laughs> right? So that's an example of a tool I've learned and I've picked up along the way that I need to put in practice to work with the conditioning that I'm always going to be contending with in my root. But because I am sharing it and it is in fact serving me by serving you, now it means that I'm aligned with my, with my design, right? So I, I'm not going to eliminate that from my experience because that would sort of defeat the purpose of being a spiritual being, having a physical experience, right? Okay. Now, the other point I wanted to make is the other piece. So you'll see, on the other hand, my sacral center is defined, okay? And now in my experience, that makes sense. So the sacral in human design functions like a motor that is always turned on. And I have always had access to a tremendous amount of life force energy and even libido. I have also, I also have a lot of access to creative skills and resources and an ability to abstract. And sometimes it's a point of pride in my personal life and even in my profession that I can conceptualize and I can explain dualities and paradoxes in our everyday lives so that people understand them and can make use of them, right? Now, in contrast, um, there we go. In contrast, two of the individuals who posed uh, today's question, they were willing to share their body graphs and I'm sharing this anonymously. Um, and their body graphs revealed that they have open sacral centers, right? So remember, our question is, um, <clears throat> I had all this attraction, all this fire, all this passion, but now my sex drive is gone. What happened, right? 
So remember, having an undefined open center simply means that you don't generate life force energy in consistent or predictable ways. The energy is more diffuse in nature, but that doesn't mean you don't have energy. It just means that you're more energized when you hook up with, or you're more organized, let's say, when you hook up with people who do have their sacral defined. And I want to just clarify, this is not like a narcissistic hoovering of someone else's life force energy. It's simply the ability to absorb and to feel energized by what someone else is just already emitting. So I would have you conceptualize your open sacral center as a solar panel. It's like a working solar panel. It's not, you know, a working solar panel doesn't steal energy from the sun, no more than your open sacral center steals energy from a partner or from someone who has a defined one. You basically soak in other people's energy just by being around them. And then within you, you can amplify that energy. So it's more than possible for someone with an open center, especially a sacral center, to feel very energetic. In fact, you could feel 10 times as energized as someone who has a defined sacral because you can collect a lot of other people's energy and ride that wave. You just need to be sure that you are expending that energy properly according to what's called your authority and your strategy. So you don't blow a fuse because your natural state is actually one that is rather neutral. Okay, when you have an open center, your natural state is typically one that's more neutral in that area. So rest is essential for you, especially after riding an incredibly high energetic wave. So you want to think of this almost as like being um, a, a, an introverted extrovert. Okay. So bringing this back to the original question, why has my sex drive suddenly gone missing? I think that I think that that is what is happening to our inquirers. They are experiencing a necessary neutralization of what is essentially a short circuit in the sacral, and this is evidenced by way of their sex drive. In other words, their libidinal life force energy has kind of zoop gone back to neutral. Um, and so it might be worth pondering also how much of that original passion and dramatic attraction and adrenaline high that these individuals felt was actually their partner's attraction to them that simply got amplified in their sacral and then they got hooked on riding that wave, right? Of course, I've never met these, I haven't spoken with these individuals uh, personally or in depth around these questions. I am making some assumptions to prove a theoretical point, but it's something worth considering. Now, of course, this interpretation is minus ruling out all of the psychobiological things we talked about in the first segment, as well as different contexts, right? So again, this is not going to explain a loss of sex drive for everyone in everybody's context. But in the context that was offered in the question here today, this is one way to think about it, okay? Now, before I bring this to a close, there are three other things I want to mention relevant to attraction in human design. Now, the first is that we tend to passionately and electromagnetically be drawn to partners whose body graphs fill in all of our open spaces. So in other words, we experience energetic polarity with those folks. Um, and this also applies to channels. Let's see, there we go. This also applies to these little channels or these lines that are drawn between energy centers. They're basically called circuitry, okay? And so, for example, when my chart, let's see if I can show you that one. So when my chart is combined with my partner's chart, you put them together. This is, I did this through the genetic matrix. When you put them together, you get a combined chart. And the combined chart is actually a representation of the life of the relationship, right? The sort of, that sort of third thing that gets created when two people come together, energetically speaking, okay? What you'll notice is that when, when my chart and my partner's chart come together, what happens? All of our centers are defined, okay? It's totally um, completed. So we complement each other. We're a complementary match for each other. And I can attest that there is a lot of passion and attraction between us. And we tend to just naturally intuit and sense each other's needs and fulfill them for the most part. But not every positive match has to have all their centers defined. And just because all centers are defined, it doesn't mean that attraction is going to translate into harmony. <laughs> um, so whatever the combination is, it's just going to inform what areas will be growth areas and which areas are going to have a more effortless balance. Okay. So for example, 
even in our charts, you'll see that we both come to the relationship with our throats defined already, which means that we both can initiate conversation and action. So both of us are really good at communication and discussion, as long as we take the time to inform each other of what we are doing and why. But that also means if we fail to do that, we can risk drowning each other out. Um, and also we can be kind of bullheaded, right? Like my way is the right way. And so even with how well matched we are, we have had a lot of loud arguments. Right? Um, so another thing that you might notice in our charts is that we both have an open root. We both come together with open roots. Okay. So why and or how is it when we come together, our open roots equal a closed root? Okay. So basically what happens is when our charts come together, there's a channel between the spleen and the root. Um, and see if I can show you it right here. You see the spleen and the root. Looks like it made a typo on my slide, but you see what I'm talking about. So between here, the spleen and the root, you see there's this little line right there that's kind of chopped off over here. You can see that line continues all the way, completes its journey. All right. So when you have that together in our composite chart, you can see here the line is completed. It becomes two halves of a whole. And when that happens, when you have a completed channel, it turns the open center into a defined one. Okay. So how does that translate into experience? Well, it means that um, independently, we both have a tendency to labor over projects, right? We both have a tendency to push ourselves past the point of exhaustion to just get it done. Um, we also um, have concerns about worthiness. We also worry about being a burden to people. We have this in common, right? Um, so, but the benefit of, of us coming together is that the energy that is created in the relationship between us stabilizes us. So being together creates this kind of consistent and regulatory energy that neither of us um, would have as easy a time cultivating on our own for ourselves, right? At least when it comes to the root and its related concerns. So overall, theoretically speaking, you are going to feel more aroused and more attraction to someone that has complementary hanging gates or an opposingly defined center in comparison to you. So the more gates and the more centers that are similarly defined between you, the more it's going to lead to a pleasant and companionable feeling, not necessarily a passionate one, okay? And because body graphs are so complex, there are a lot of different combinations that could lead to a healthy balance of arousing and companionable, right? Because you also don't want a chart that's all arousing because then there's nowhere to breathe, there's nowhere to land, there's no harmony, right? So now the second thing that I wanted to mention is if you have a chart that has more defined centers, and I'll bring mine up again. So if you have a chart that has more defined centers, like I do, I have six out of nine defined centers, then you're more likely to feel like someone who can function optimally with or without a partner. And you're likely to need a part, you're not likely to need a partner to feel that complete. Okay. So I have six out of nine centers defined. Why is that? Well, it's because you just naturally have access to a lot of clearly defined, consistent sources of energy. But you can also be limited by that kind of consistent definition, right? Of course, that doesn't mean that you're not going to want partnership. That doesn't mean you're not going to benefit from partnership. And it doesn't mean that you're not going to want it. It also doesn't make you like superior to someone who has a different blueprint. It just means that you have a certain learning curriculum in this lifetime and your chart is going to facilitate those lessons with that curriculum. Now, on the other hand, if you're someone who has more open centers like my partner here, you're more likely to be someone that functions a lot better in relationship to others, whether that is part of a close knit community or with a romantic partner. Okay. So you may also feel less complete unless you have close relationships because it's harder for you to naturally summon those energetic resources consistently. However, 
you are also more likely to be more flexible, more open-minded, more adaptable to change, um, especially within relationship. And you are capable of collecting and dispersing a lot more energy than someone that has defined centers, as long as you do it correctly. Okay. Okay. Now, finally, your profile number if you go to my human design, anyone, again, myhumandesign.com or geneticmatrix.com, it gives you a bunch of information. One of those things is your profile, okay? So your profile number has a big influence on your chart. So if you look at your profile number in your body graph, um, I'm going to share mine with you. This first one, this is where you'll find it on the genetic matrix body graph. My profile is a 4-6, and here they describe this as an opportunistic uh, role model. If we look at the human design one, it is, a, they call it a regal authority figure. I personally really like the language of my human design better, but the genetic matrix gives you more features. There's so much to say about this, but what I want to point out for today, what's most relevant to our conversation, is if the first number is smaller in your chart, like it is in mine, then it means you have personal karma. So that means that you came to this incarnation to know your worth through self-discovery and exploration. So put yourself solely in the service of others if you want to feel worthy is not the kind of wisdom that is going to help you, okay? It's not going to help someone that has personal karma. Instead, advice like follow your bliss or discover what lights you up and do it no matter what anybody else says, that is good advice for you. Now, it doesn't mean that you're not here to uplift others, but it should not be the basis upon which you find yourself worth. You're more likely to uplift others just by being who you are and kind of living your life out loud as an example to others, right? In comparison, I'm going to show you my, my partner's charts. You can see we're very, we're very opposite each other. Okay, so in my partner's chart, um, he has a 6-2. So in the genetic matrix profile, it says uh, role model hermit. And in the my human design chart, it says exemplary human, right? Okay. So folks with, this is th someone who has uh, the larger number first, they're considered to have transpersonal karma. Okay, so someone with transpersonal karma comes here to be of service to others. So finding worth in solitary meditation on top of a mountain is not actually going to be very effective for someone with transpersonal karma, but it might work if they go with a group of their closest friends, right? In fact, the more these folks remove themselves from other people, the worse they're probably going to feel. So these folks feel more worthy by measuring how much they have lifted somebody else up. So when you feel helpless, help somebody else is a good example of a transpersonal statement because they're going to feel more agency in that, right? So these folks are often, they are the glue of a community. They are the people that you feel the most comfortable seeking out for support, comfort, advice, things like that. Now, theoretically, with a knowledge of human design, um, ideally, we are able to balance our energetic inheritance in a way that we want. So once we have the knowledge and the skills necessary to address any conditioning in our open centers and we utilize your strategy or your authority to get what you need in the unique way that you need it, then you're able to kind of operate from a place of balance, okay? Um, getting into strategy and authority is well beyond the scope of this discussion here today, um, but you know I invite you to check it out with those resources if this is something you want to learn more about. So, okay, here we are. I'm going to summarize this discussion. I know I've thrown a lot of information and facts at you here today. Um, so I, I want to just start to bring this to a close. So for today's question, we are examining the abrupt loss of sexual interest and arousal after experiencing intense arousal with a relatively charged conflictual or dramatic relationship situation. And in this case, it's likely there's been a history of repeated relationships like this. So the first thing we did is we examined a bio a, I'm sorry, a psychobiological explanation for this kind of attraction, including the impact of naturally occurring neurochemical transmitters in the brain, specifically how it responds to intermittent reinforcement and feelings of frustration, right? And then in, th in that framework, we assumed that the arousal system may have turned off because it's in a deactivated state of self-protection, okay? Breaking that cycle includes body-based interventions that help regulate the brain and nervous system, 
I recommend therapeutic interventions like somatic experiencing, EMDR, brain spotting, accelerated resolution therapy, creative arts therapies, dance movement therapy, neurofeedback, biofeedback, and, and other experiential and or body-based trauma-informed approaches. Okay. Now, secondly, we conceptualized sexual arousal as an expression of libidinal life force energy. And we looked at the Hindu chakra system as a framework for understanding how energy evolves in early childhood attachment experiences. Specifically, we looked at the root in the sacral chakra and how that can influence the way you experience energy or charge in your body relevant to relationships, attraction, and arousal. As an extension of that discussion, we looked at the impact of the root and sacral through the framework of human design. And I provided some personal examples of this system and how it can describe energetic behavior in a relationship and um, compatibility, right? So examining the loss of sex drive and attraction through this framework, we might deduce that our inquirers, those who brought this question to our attention, are basically experiencing the neutralization of a blown fuse. And why is that? Well, because both of our inquirers had open sacral centers, where which are energy centers that can absorb the life force energy from others and amplify it. If it is not expended properly or the proper boundaries are not put in place to differentiate that energy, then that can lead to exhaustion, burnout, and depletion, right? And this may be the loss of sex drive that they are experiencing, okay? Um, on a personal note, I personally really like this system because I find it to be very elegant. Um, I think it takes existing concepts of energy, including binary concepts of masculine and feminine polarities and sexuality, and it reveals that it is so much more complex and subtle um, and exists, especially while existing on the level of desire and attraction. I think it also provides a way to navigate through the influence of social conditioning around human relationships on every level and add to that our inclinations in relationships to change and evolve based on the many different combinations possible when you interact with somebody's energy, okay? So overall, I just feel like there's a tremendous amount of permission to just experience what you are experiencing without having to qualify it as better or worse than something else, right? Um, and I think ultimately that should be our goal. <laughs> now, whew, if any of that resonates with you, I'd love to read your thoughts and your reflections again in the comments. That's always going to help me uh, develop more content moving forward. And, um, and I just love to hear how you are receiving it.